Hello, welcome here <laughs> to this talk. Um, so what I will talk about uh, is alternative dramaturgies for cross-cultural productions and productions representing the so-called other. Uh, our complex world has gradu gradually created an increasing number of lines and borders. Social constructs with the function of enforcing order and negotiating land and power, but also deliberately separating people from one another. This is something anyone programming a festival with artists from around the globe experiences first hand. For this festival, artists from some countries didn't even need a visa to travel here, while artists from other countries undergo a process of gathering numerous documents or even doing thorough interviews before they have any chance of being granted visas for a week in Norway. And this year, like two years ago, Norwegian, Norwegian Asetej was very disappointed to learn that the performance, uh, because we were very, we wanted uh, to have all continents represented at the festival, and then we learned that the African uh, performance, uh, they had to, it had to change and adapt due to uh, visa issues. This curbs artistic voices and diminishes perspectives. The angles most needed are often the ones furthest away. Theater and performing arts hold the potential to dramatize, disrupt, negotiate, and redraw this um, delineations. However, the colonial legacy in Europe has established a Eurocentric intellectual heritage, which shapes specific approaches to production, work, methodology, theory, text, time distribution, as well as cultural ideas around ethics and values. In cross-cultural productions, a hierarchical production framework in theater can easily affect a subject group negatively by uh, undermining essential critical perspectives, as well as revealing an inability to address the cultural complexity of the group that is being represented. Um, so a little bit about me. I'm a, I am myself uh, from a Western European cultural uh, background, and I grew up within the frames of the Western European narrative. But three and a half years ago, I relocated from Norway to uh, Cape Town, South Africa, to work on an applied theater program, and thereby um, embarked on a journey that has prompted me to question the value systems and master narratives that I grew up with. My hope is that the integration of reflexivity as part of my work has generated an increased sensitivity towards the micropolitics of cross-cultural theater productions representing uh, and representation in theater. And uh, as this talk is limited to one hour, I will move forward quite quickly. However, I hope that in the end I will get uh, a few minutes to uh, that we will uh, get a few minutes to discuss because um, yeah uh, I know that um, depending on which country you're from uh, as participant in this festival this conversation may, may be something you've dealt with the entire your entire life or it may be in a, a completely new conversation so the perspectives also within this festival are very different. Um, and uh, first and foremost, I encourage you to regard my talk as an invitation to new ways of thinking and questioning. So why this talk uh, in a theater festival for children and young people? Because cross and intercultural collaboration and cultural exchange constitutes an antidote to systemic othering in a split world. However, it is evident that we start examining how these collaborations are executed. It matters not only which stories we tell our children, but how we tell them. 
The structures that inform the stories we tell our children will in turn form their view on the world and on other people. Um, yeah. And just to clarify, when I use the terms dominant and subordinate culture, I point to the power imbalance between uh, majority and minority culture. Because often in cross-cultural uh, collaboration, the funding, for example, is predominantly from one country, and that already creates a, a power imbalance that one must be wary of, especially in the current context of Eurocentrism. And then there's an, a lot of other aspects like work language and which text you choose to work uh, from and uh, things like that. I'm very fascinated by this. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Um, when I use, uh, no, in recent years, Europe has undergone extensive and destabilizing processes, both economically and politically. In spite of a history of minority persecution, predominantly of Jews, but also other minorities, it appears that dehumanizing mechanisms are once again sweeping across the European society. And this time, refugees are being increasingly and systematically ostracized and dehumanized. Dram dramatity in performing arts is concerned, amongst other things, with how different forms of narratives are constructed and how they in turn affect the spectator. Over the past few years, I have become increasingly concerned with the structural, structural ramifications of the Eurocentric narrative and how it potentially uh, propagates othering. When theatre companies in Western European countries, such as uh, the Scandinavian countries, the Netherlands, Belgium, France, Germany, produce theatre representing minorities, such as refugees and migrants, they work within a Eurocentric tradition, within a given political and cultural discourse, and often with, within a hierarchical uh, production framework. And as consequence, cultural, there is a danger that cultural imbalance is easily replicated implicitly or explicitly as part of the artistic product. These productions will therefore not necessarily contribute to decreasing or challenging the sovereignty of a dom the dominant culture, but will rather reproduce and confirm the binary, us, them, which is precisely the structure producers and artists in most cases claim to want to counteract. And therefore, it is essential to question whether decision-making is ever truly shared as long as one group has more power than the other. When we talk about inclusion in art institutions, what are included people invited to engage in? Are they invited to speak truth to power? Are they encouraged to reflect on the social realities of power, to ameliorate the effects of power? Um, and to quote a British educational um, scholar and activist, uh, Christy Taylor, it's of great importance to examine various counter uh, I always find it hard to say hegemonic, hegemonic strategies to oppose the established structures of the art world as the dominating narratives of the art world excludes large consistencies of people and therefore reinforce discriminatory discourses that may remain unchallenged. And from that perspective, curatorial activism um, can be described as a process to ferret out, to tally, to count, and to throw inequities into high relief, laying bare the powerful ideological mechanisms that ensure that some artists are celebrated while others are marginalized. Uh, and one uh, essential element here is, of course, to challenge the Western canon. Professor of theater studies, I have to, I, I want to free myself from this little station here. Um, um, professor of Theatre Studies at Florida University, Ralf Fremschat, claims that the Western theatre's attempt to come to terms with a refugee crisis through performance is already irrevocably imbricated with the medial matrix in which it exists. According to his view, not only indigenous people, but also refugees and migrants have become, and he's quite harsh in the way uh, in what he claims, has become creatures of the mass medial imagination, 
in which images and narratives of individual suffering feed emotional concerns, but do not um, call for systemic change. And such does the West, by means of its post-traumatic, deconstructed theater, often keep commenting on itself rather than shifting focus to that which is different. Uh, Remschat goes as far as to state that Western theater, like Europe, has fashioned a moral image of itself which it aims to defend. And he, he says that search, as such, the theater has become a simulacrum that relies on internal representation that both enforces its sense of sovereignty and exposes its radical contingency and fictiousness. In productions representing refugees or other minorities, they are seldom given the mandate to lead or make decisions in the production process. But often, even in theater aiming to debate the issue, remain nameless and voiceless, seen as refugees, but seldom as individuals or as artists. And this can be regarded as a repeated abuse, since the lack of mandate is a core issue for any refugee. And this becomes particularly problematic in theater productions that want to problematize refugee rights, but instead have the same dynamics rooted within the operation of uh, their institutions or the way that they produce. From this point of view, some of the most central questions concerning representation of minorities in theater then become, what does it mean to provide space for a minority group in theater production? What does it entail to offer a mandate within the framework of Western theater creation? Or to turn it around, what becomes the requirements of the framework itself? Um, and uh, over the past few years, so it's not all, you know, <laughs> this is quite harsh and critical, but there is also many artists that aim to challenge these frameworks and ways of storytelling. And um, uh, especially over the past few years, I don't know how many of you that have heard of, for example, ways of seeing, at least in, <laughs> in one of the Nordic countries, uh, you probably heard about it. It was a Norwegian production uh, created in 2018 that's created all right, uh, yeah, I, I won't go too much into it because I tend to be unable to stop when I start talking about it because it still fascinates me so much, but it was, <laughs> but, but it was um, basically, uh, it was an artistic collective. It was uh, artists with migrant backgrounds um, and artists that did not have migrant backgrounds. Um, and they created a performance where they really directed harsh criticism towards the Norwegian far right and the way that, uh, how you say, they kind of pinpointed and really dissected uh, the, the power systems of the far right and, uh, yeah. So, uh, and that created a chain of political events that eventually led to the Minister of Foreign Affairs, he had to leave his job. Mm. And it's, it, that's very interesting. And I, I will also be thinking, what provokes so much? And I think part of what provokes, of course it was, it had a very, how you say, a, a distinctive, like dramaturgical frame that was provocative, but I think also what provoked was that the, the, ref, uh, the people with migrant backgrounds and former refugees, they, 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 didn't, they, they didn't perform on stage the way that we were used to see them. Because we're not used to see uh, criticism and that they really take mandates um, uh, yeah, and, and appear in a different way on stage. Anyway, that was a, like a long, uh -uh, let's go back to <laughs> what I really wanted to to talk about another performance. Um, the Danish uh, independent theater company, Fix and Foxy, uh, had uh, produced a play, uh, spring 2019, uh, called Dark Noon, and uh, where they, uh, they had the aim to uh, disrupt and problematize Eurocentrism. Uh, and there is an interactive and immersive level in the work of Fix and Foxy that breaks with the concept of either looking or being looked at. It creates a more tangible, multisensory way of interacting that unsettles the line between performer and spectator, which may become problematic um, when the audience represent the majority culture and the performers the minority. And um, the, dramaturg the dramaturgical frame aims to highlight um, and accentuate, 
accentuate the uh, problematic power imbalance between the global north and the global south and binary issues such as colonialism and decolonization, black and white. The performance is based on the myths that Europeans have created about the African continent, about Africans and about themselves, and it has the aim to dismantle these um, fictional stories. And this approach to turn the tables by inviting a group of uh, South African artists to tell their wild and lawless, uh, tell the wild and lawless story of Western civilization from their perspective. Um, yeah. And in the making of uh, Dark Noon, the director, Tuve Bjerring, uh, teamed up with a South African actor, teacher, composer, and choreographer, um, because it was important for him to kind of uh, he didn't want to be the only uh, director because he, he understood the fragile position of that. <laughs> um, so he really, uh, yeah, he, he co-directed it. Um, and um, he also considered it essential to in initiate um, artistic uh, partnership with um, people from the black community in order to create an understanding of the perspective, narrative and cultural context of black South Africans. For the same reason, the first block of the production took place in Johannesburg. But Bjerring admittedly still found himself captured in the European narrative. And, um, this is a quote from an interview that I did with him. I have to admit that our European narrative is difficult to, accept, uh, to escape. To a certain extent, we are condemned to our European frameworks to be able to convey the perspective of the other in a re relatable way. And within that lie, uh, form of, lies a form of repetitive abuse, which is problematic. But if we cannot entirely escape it, we're all the more obliged to problematize it. In Dark Noon, we attempt to do precisely that by telling the story through perhaps one of the banalest narratives there is, <coughs> the Western. Uh, according to Bjerring, the Western format gave an opportunity to highlight the limited notions Europeans have about Africa and how Europeans still tend to imagine a continent as wild, lawless, and dangerous. Uh, and another uh, quote, <laughs> as a European, you carry with your, you this exalted notion about yourself. So by placing the European colonist in the position of the cowboy, this adventurous troublemaker with a gun in his belt and a reckless thirst for gold, you force the spectators to look at the armed Europeans who suddenly turned up on the African continent and claimed their right for land in a different light. By drawing on the European emigration stories, the European ethno-romantic feel-good version, the European dream of Africa, soon turns not so feel-good. And as part of confronting the Danish audience with their history and inherited privilege, Dark Noon, as mentioned, it had an immersive form, where the audience stand, walk, and are given particular functions and actions throughout the piece. They're instructed to play the roles of churchgoers, bar clientele, and even line dancers. At one point, the audience also cheer on. What they not yet uh, understand is a slave auction, and they're encouraged to Instagram uh, this with their cell phones. And in this way, the audience is confronted rather brutally with the Danish past as the contributing colonizers of the African continent. They are exposed to this history firsthand from the African perspective, in the face-to-face -face situation of a shared physical space. The overall aim is that being exposed in this way will make it much more difficult for a Danish audience to disregard the Afrocentric perspective as irrelevant and uh, inauthentic. And then I could, could mention numerous artists and directors that work um, with um, uh, conceptual dramaturgy as a way to form new narratives and uh, challenge the old, um, and Edith Calder in her performance Cé de Chinois. It's something I, I won't go into now, but it's really something to check out. She kind of, for the audience to follow the story, they have to learn phrases in Mandarin. And what she wants to problematize is the, um, uh, the feeling of not, how fragile you are where you, where you can't, uh, yeah, when you, where you don't know the um, language of the new culture, and you have to adapt. So. It's kind of very comic, very funny, and yeah, 
interesting piece. It's not very new, but it's it's really good. And also, it's also interesting. While most pieces play with uh, redeploying the power balance, finding different ways of turning things on the head, uh, Milo Rao he works differently. Uh, as he's very well known, as you, you probably mo many of you know him, and he's, he's become quite a mastodont himself, like being a white, powerful male, <laughs> which is a little bit ironic, but again. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> but he has, for example, um, he has uh, the Congo Tribunale is where he, he um, what he does is that he creates uh, enactments of historical events because he, he really tries to avoid the us them or even redeploying us them. He rather wants us to <sighs> investigate history and try to, um, how do you say, um, by looking at historical events and kind of analyzing them, uh, recognizing the tendencies in our own time. Uh, yep. The theater can mount a direct challenge to how people of the mi majority culture, through the gaze of the other, are confronted with how they appear in the world. And this insight often uncomfortably contradicts how they wish to perceive themselves. These performances do not deal with racism through dramatic text and character depictions, but just as much by the visual, medial, and spatial dramaturgical choices, and how these choices structure, shape, and highlight the themes and overall messages the artists want to convey to the public. In order to tackle the mechanisms of othering in the theater, we have to ask ourselves what the opposite of othering is. If othering is uh, alienation and ex exclusion, then its opposite must be belonging and inclusion. But belonging is emotionally determined and entails the experience of having a meaningful voice um, and the opportunity to participate in the design of cultural and social structures. The experience of meaningfulness can only be determined independently by the subordinate group themselves. From this insight, how can we create belongingness in our theater spaces? This may be a core question which allows us to move away from the idea of mere uh, representation towards the concept of co-creation as some kind of premise. Um, and then let's look at how we can change the, nar the narrative. From a dramaturgical point of view, is it even possible to imagine dramaturgical frameworks in Western Europe that are entirely detached from Eurocentric pervasive thinking? Or are we ever caught in dichotomies? If we believe that this is somehow achievable, where do we start with working towards achieving it? What dramaturgical strategies can best serve the process of countering structure, structural othering in theater making? How can one establish an equal ground for creative, cross-cultural processes to flourish? I have extract, er, I have tried to, but this is kind of some aspects meant to function as propositions, perhaps guidelines, for equalization in cross and cultural theatre. But it can also just be a way to try and see things in new in new ways. So it's not I really don't want this talk to be this is bad, this is good, but rather <laughs> try and look at things from, from a new perspective. Cultivating reflexivity. One cannot expect to identify the structural patterns and hidden power hierarchies of Western contemporary theater without the willingness to continuously examine how Eurocentric discourses reinforce decision-making and power distribu distribution within Western theater institutions, within productions, and within intercultural collaborations. Here, of course, critical whiteness is a central theory to turn to. Critical whiteness has particular relevance for raising awareness of the fact that whiteness as a cultural and social political construction expresses a privileged position of power often exercised on a subconscious level. However, while critical whiteness is just a partial means to the goal of inclusivity, it is all too often regarded as the goal. The way critical whiteness theory is often interpreted, this reflective critique of whiteness and white pri privilege often remains the focal point and the goal in and of itself. And this can create a perception that it's enough to be aware of and talk about injustice 
and express gratitude for one's privileges, all the while avoiding taking active stance or action against this injustice to counter it effectively. The conversations can become an excuse and a buyout from responsibility. As such, critical whiteness may be used instrumentally to conceal imperialist motives. And I mean, this is, a, this is not like more in an in a unconscious way than in a conscious way. Um, much like in theater, self-reflexivity and critical introspection can serve the instrumental purpose of primarily handing negative, handling negative feelings connected to guilt and privilege. And the point that I want to stress here is that alternative cultural perspectives are neither identified, explored, nor integrated into society by introspection alone. One of the recurrent causes for systematic othering is the lack of acknowledgement of alternative perspectives and an unwillingness to incorporate these. Am I talking too fast? Is it like, <laughs> okay. I, 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 I never talk this much in a row, so I'm kind of like, ooh, <laughs> a lot of talking. Okay. Um, yes, so uh, the Norwegian uh, dramaturg and theater professor Tore Wangen Lee in his publication, Reflexive Dramaturgy, a Cheats for the Performing Arts in a Time of Change, is concerned with how there is a um, reciprocal, I can't never pronounce that word, <laughs> um, recipro yeah, reciprocal, re you know what word I mean, yeah. yeah. Ugh. Impact between the theater production apparatus and the artistic investigation, which may develop into a kind of um, gravitational force that is in itself powerful enough to override even the strongest um, directorial concept. And this gravitational force, he says, is produced not just by material and practical constraints, such as space, time limits, financial circumstances, and other framework conditions. Um, rather, it's a force that carries its own um, payload of inherent conceptions, like sediments, its own meta-narratives, in which thus has the capacity to activate, activate its own dramaturgies. Okay, that's a long and complicated sentence, but um, he says something about the, I think it's very hmm, applicable to how Eurocentrism works. Uh, Lead calls with urgency to discuss how power and structure affect artistic processes and the way stories are formed and portrayed. He stresses that the theater cultivates a false image of itself, but that reflexive dramaturgy can serve to identify and articulate the structures that set the limits for the aesthetic experience and artistic investigation. Lee talks about zones of productive uncertainty, by which I think he means <laughs> a new dramaturgical conceptual thinking sparked by the unsettlement of the classical production hierarchy of Western theater as a result of, amongst other things, increased interdisciplinarity. And he refers to Pierre Bourdieu and how dramaturgy has much to gain from sociology. And he also quotes an essay by Norwegian sociologist uh, Magne Flemmen on Bourdieu. The world with all its dominant relations seems natural to us. The task of sociology is to reveal the arbitrary privileges and how they are reproduced. The power must be rooted out of the dark discognition and be exposed to what it really is. If we understand the mechanisms that maintain this dominance, we might be able to change it. And I think performing arts very much also have this potential. However, I would say, one can only achieve this by pushing through the structural changes that critical whiteness sets us in the direction of. The subject-object relation between minority that uh, majority and minority, dominant and subordinate culture has to be renegotiated, unsettled and shifted. Such a shift entails the will to let go of power, to listen and to be humble. Humility in practice is about a vigil... <laughs> oh, there's, there are some English words that I can never, can never learn how to say. Um, about a vigilant form of active listening and the will and ability to remove oneself and one's agenda and urge to control as a frame for the artistic process. Only then does looking become a political act in favor of the subordinated, suppressed and discriminated. And I just want to emphasize here that I, of course, I don't mean that this is necessary in all types of performance and in, 
you know, in any way. It's more about opening up the perspective to other ways of producing. Redistribution of power. It is evident to direct significant attention to the choices made in dramaturgical process methodology in cross and intercultural theater production. There is much to suggest that the answers for equalization, which seems, seems impossible to find by searching within the Western Eurocentric narrative, might be found by the dominant culture's will to adapt towards the subordinate. As such, devising can constitute an interesting al alternative to text as a starting point in theater production processes where a minority is represented due to the fact that devising is a process-led dramaturgical practice. In devised work, the content structure and form are gradually determined as the process unfolds. There is no contractual hierarchy or other working structure imposed on the makers. Instead of the ensemble being subordinate to, subordinate to a director's vision, the material is generated by the ensemble's intuitive response to various uh, impulses and stimuli. And while this stimuli and tasks in most cases are still designed by the director, it has still undergone uh, the production structure has still undergone radical moderation. Devised work involves a shift in the performance function from merely constituting a part of another's vision to becoming co-creators of its design. And in this respect, there is a tilt from subject-object um, method of working towards a subject-subject approach. Additionally, an experienced ownership of the theme is crucial for the cast to be uh, able to uh, generate ideas and creative material. Thus, the level of experienced ownership in a devised process can be directly linked to the quality of the end product, which as such functions as a litmus test uh, on whether the process generated a fruitful group synergy or not. In theater aiming to represent the so-called other, Devising can, I can contend, contribute to an equalization of power between dominant and peripheral culture, self and other. However, the method of devising requires the production apparatus and uh, director to accept a significant loss of control. Devising is an interesting method for acceptance and inclusion of various lenses or windows uh, of the same work. In devising, the lens of acting Dramaturging or directing is separated from the person. While it is true that the director is the person who makes the final decisions about how the, how the play is put together, this aspect of control and power can be negotiated in various way, ways. Since the devised performance usually does not um, depart from or comment on a canonized script familiar in the dominant culture, it also opens up the possibility of a non-verbal methodological approach in the early days of a production process. This means that the ensemble may start working from um, specific improvisation exercises that do not even include verbal language. In cross and intercultural productions, where it is often the language of the dominant culture that forms the basis of communication, this establishes a common ground from where a unifying group vocabulary of movement and gestures can emerge. Devising poses an intentional challenge to the dominant model of an autonomous, all-seeing, all-knowing director, author, and look to establish a more pluralist approach to performance making and improvisation. As a non-hierarchical framework, this approach is interesting because rather than imposing external notions or layering preconceptions onto a creative ensemble's work process, devising seeks to locate compositional form and decision-making from within the experience of the practice itself. One can argue that the framework of devising... Uh, un momento, lost it. Um, yeah. One can argue that the framework of devising fosters a creative universe where the hierarchical structure of the outside world does not apply. It constitutes both a, sor a source of conflict and a productive element, and thereby opens up a third space. I don't know if you have heard of um, Baba, 
Humi Baban, when the way he talks about the third space, which is of course a very different thing. Um, but still, uh, if if we depart from Baba's cultural theory, uh, hybridity and the third space stands at the, as a, the central figure. Baba sees hybridity as an active challenge to the dominant culture. In relation to dramaturgy, the question then becomes, is such a concept applicable to the dynamics of devising and similar approaches taken to escape the Eurocentric uh, hegemony? <laughs> is it called hegemony or hegemony? Hegemony? Who cares? Uh, in cross and intercultural theater production. How could this idea of a third space lead the way towards the development of new dramaturgical ideas, concepts, and frameworks? From this, in the creation of non-hierarchical dramaturgical <coughs> production platforms, the overall goal becomes to foster entirely new communities, which lifts us up out of the ordinary and creates the possibility of new meetings, human to human. Questioning constructs. Ooh. Is it possible to take elements from devising and develop them further to serve productions that specifically aim to address and question social constructs? There is a clear line from the history of colonization, the establishment of different forms of social constructs, racial and par uh, patriarchal thinking, to capitalism, neoliberalism, and the current structures within Western theater institutions. Looking at contemporary Europe through this lens, our current world becomes a multi-layered web of spa uh, spatial syntaxes, full of visible and invisible cultural and political fences that separate us into a web of groups and subgroups. However, when we tell stories in our theatres, these structures often remain unaddressed. We speak about destinies shaped by specific structures, but we seldom speak of the structures. In relation to refugees, this becomes particularly evident. Refugees are attuned to the fragility of the social structures upon which they stand. They know that whatever is fixed today can be torn away tomorrow. By creating a dramaturgical frame where one makes use of improv improvisational and experimental principles of play structures and enactment, I believe that one can promote an understanding of citizenship as a spatially negotiated practice. However, one then has to translate the way in which citizenship and non-citizenship is performed in Western societies to the performative language of the theater. From a bird's eye perspective, a dramaturgical frame highlighting these structures can provide an understanding of the ways in which we inhabit our identities and ourselves. This can be achieved by investigating and underlining the relation between structure, pattern, and human interaction in order to spark new artistic and political conversations. By doing this, one can also prompt awareness within the Western theater production apparatus as to how constructed systems in our societies and the world reflect within the theater space. This dramaturgical approach to theater making aims to highlight and problematize social structures as part of the process of analyzing what enables mechanisms, what enables mechanisms of othering. To sum up, the spatial aspect of dramaturgy and the way in which space can be utilized, negotiated, charged, changed, and manipulated between the performers in a piece can serve to highlight how citizenship and non-citizenship is a negotiating practice where power, or lack of such, enables or deprives individuals from taking up space on this planet. Establishing community. If the ambition is for the theatre to serve as a space of belonging across cultural borders, then how can this be achieved and what does it require? If the artistic potential is separated from the reliance on any external factors stemming from Western theatre tradition, what new creative tools may emerge as a result? What most certainly will remain are the bodies in the space and the value of the totality of creative resources and cultural perspectives that constitutes the ensemble's common capacity. To draw further on the ideas 
of the Weisingen viewpoints, even if the concept of universalism is dismantled, dismantled in post-traumatic theater. Within cross and intercultural the theater making, the quality of the encounter between the participants in the production is essential. However, such encounters require an, an authentic meeting between humans on equal ground. As such, is it not evident that we should search for the universal parameters and unifying elements amongst all people? Creativity, collaboration, imagination, adaptability, and flexibility are quality everyone shares. For the theatre space, these capacities are ideal. How can we best mobilize them method methodologically and endorse them in intercultural creative projects? However, that is a more complicated issue. By starting a production process with the establishment of a common vocabulary of movement gesture, gestures or other types of, of ways to create norms um, for creation within the group, one promotes an experience of community, ownership, and belonging that in cross-cultural projects representing minorities is hardly possible from within a hierarchical form of production. Are you still alive? <laughs> okay, I know it's been a Friday, lots of, uh, lots of talks, okay. <laughs> The development of ensemble cohes cohesion and rituals constitutes a part of the uh, equalization of the creative space. <coughs> By creating a common vocabulary and an altered state of consciousness, not as a spiritual, a spiritual condition, but rather as a method of removing the mind from the purely remote, cerebral and analytical towards a now orientation, and a more physically anchored, intuitive, and collectively oriented um, creative condition. These ideas are not new. Uh, 20th century physical theater theorists Grotowski, Artaud, Nicolas Nunes, and uh, Alexander Fersen all drew inspiration from different um, techniques, uh, ritual techniques and practices in order to explore alternative approaches to perform a community. However, while these methods seem to have many common denominators across cultural and geographical borders, they have not been much included in the pract practices of larger Western theater institutions. When a creative group generates rules of their own, their own rather than conforming to existing norms, they can thereby create a sense of filling the gaps amongst each other. And then I think actually I may have to to um, hop a little bit further <laughs> because um, yeah I think I may have to jump. Um, hmm. Because it's still yeah it takes a little bit more time than I thought. I will. Um, I could go more into depth with this, but I think uh, I think you got the idea um, of building a, a collective space. Um, Rethinking uh, distribution of time and space. As mentioned before, classical Western dramaturgy builds on the perception of time as a temporal horizontality, a journey from one moment to the next on a horizontal line or traje trajectory. However, there are cultural differences around the globe that have resulted in different approaches to dramatic and dramaturgical structural thinking, including process dramaturgy and pre preferred ways of structuring a creative process. The bottom line here is to open the Western mind to alternative approaches to the understanding and structuring of time, both within the creative production process and in conceptual thinking around performance dramaturgy. Thus, by cultivating the notion of time as context and culture dependent and promoting the ability to question the traditional Western ideas of time efficiency and time management in creative processes, one takes yet another step towards an equalization, moving away from the culture representing, representing towards the culture being represented. And I, I very much experienced that because I've produced um, 
uh, made a um, Norwegian South African co-production, and the way, and also later on, um, I've experienced how I, as a Norwegian, want to structure a creative process. It's very different from how you you may want to stru uh, structure a creative process uh, in another culture, and. And that's also just to kind of be aware, not necessarily dismissing everything, but just to be aware that creative processes doesn't necessarily have to be structured the same way. Um, and really be aware of what you may impose because you're, you haven't thought about it. Every time we haven't thought about it, we easily impose things on others. Um, yeah. A creative process constitutes jumps in time, and one performance may consist of multiple times, multiple through lines weaved together into a non-linear narrative emerging from the artistic findings or occurring at its own pace. The redefining of the parameters, parameters for measuring time and space in this context, context again points to the shift from linear to non-linear dramaturgies and the movement away from the dominance of Western culture towards the unknown, unpredictable and unfamiliar. In performance, time can be structured in a variety of different ways and, as previously stressed, the dramatic question is often no longer the core of the narrative and the relation between images and episodes form circular, associative or spiral-like structures. Furthermore, the notion of Space and spatial dramaturgy is another aspect where bias and presumption often blur, blur the Western mind, like I was just mentioning. Again, people in everyday life encounter each other through a system of entities that have emanated from episodes of interaction. In this sense, the space itself becomes an actor, an entity which in and of itself is both a social product and an active part of social organization, created by the dynamic relationship <laughs> between subjects and hold the power to affect socialis socialization. This becomes evident in the architecture of places, cities and societies with vast demographic inequality. Here, the structures formed over time and which one unwittingly adapts to become a narrative that is manifested in spatial patterns. Even as inhabitants of a specific space, we're also subjected to that space. This makes it relevant to try and reformulate spaces of citizenship and uncouple the structural dynamics of the world system and its historical processes through the means of performing arts, such as physical theater or dance theater. For example, if we depart from a definition of choreography as consisting of distributing bodies and their relations in space, the body becomes an actor that participates in a production of a spe specific social reality. As such, social choreography as a term can point to the expanded choreographic concept of movement in social and societal spaces. This is a form of thinking that, again, can spark new conceptual ideas around the potential of spatial dramaturgy in theatre re representing refugees and other minorities. Imagined futures, the dream as activism and political resistance. To continuously question the structures and circumstances of the present and to insist on the dream of an imagined future as a one day achievable alternative to the current reality is for minorities, refugees and other discriminated groups in society perhaps the most radical form of resistance as well as possible the hardest to retain. The migrant's dream of survival as a form of afterlife, as explained by Baba, stresses this point. However, the baggage and traumatic imprints of austerity, racism, structure, structural discrimination and the legacy of displacement can easily foster an over-determination of the past in the imagining of the future. Furthermore, stories told in the theater reinforce beliefs around placement, identity, and what is possible and not possible. And here, Afrofuturism constitutes a potent contemporary art form, academic theory and dramaturgical possibility on the basis of uh, which one might change the historical trajectory and reframe the Eurocentric master narrative. 
by moving away from the potentially reinforcing loop of retelling and reliving past suffering and victimization towards narratives reclaiming power and the right to take ownership, influence, and dream one directs critique towards Western culture and the colonial history at the same time. This constitutes a wish for theater to point towards what reality could be and can become, not only to what it currently is. And um, now, right now in South Africa, um, people are really exploring um, uh, Afrofuturism and, and how that can constitute kind of a new way of uh, thinking dramaturgy and thinking storytelling uh, because yeah, there's a, a lot of um, uh, South African artists that I know and I've spoke to they are really tired of performing their own suffering that's how they get funding that's what the Western world wants to see uh, and so it's kind of a repetitive and the more you repeat the story the more true it becomes <laughs> in a way that's the, only, then that's, that's the narrative that kind of traps you so that's why the um, Afrofuturism have now, um, yeah, it's, it's not a new thing, but it's a quite new thing within um, theater and performance. Uh, uh, uh. First, through understanding representation as a form of co-production and abandoning the misconception that a dominant culture can succeed in any form of representation without actively striving towards the culture it wants to represent, both in the artistic process, in method, and all other aspects of production. It is crucial to be extremely aware of and challenge the extensive bias within theater productions representing the so-called other. Shared decision-making can constitute a way to create political and social change through art, you don't merely consume history, you interact with it, reflect on it, and gain new understanding of it. By developing dramaturgical production frameworks that, through different methodologies, aesthetics, and artistic approaches, serve the purpose of highlighting social construct, and which makes us rethink our position within them as dramaturgs, directors, and performers, we can address the master narratives and overarching structures of the world to which we're all subordinated. What is required is the cultivation of reflexivity, redistribution of power, and the fostering of community within production, the continuous questioning of Western master narratives, social constructs, and Western presumptions when it comes to distribution of time and space, as well as rebellious imagining of different futures both in and outside of the creative space. The need for directors, theater makers, and dramaturgs with the capability to truly comprehend their delicate intermediary position of cultural hybridity with all the responsibility, humility, and insight it, that entails. Mediation, negotiation, cultur cultural translation, and visual, vision is crucial. In our broken world, if theater holds the position of creating fictional universes, it is also obliged to show that other realities, uh, oh sorry, I jumped, <laughs> I jumped over that. Um, other realities, other ways, other worlds are possible. That was my talk. <laughs> I know it was kind of dense, kind of ac academic, and um, uh, and also kind of revolutionary. <laughs> yeah. uh, do you have any questions, comments? Um, do you I, want the mic? Or? Uh, no, I don't we don't need that. I didn't. No. Uh, thank you very much. That was a very interesting talk. Um, I didn't understand the concept of social choreography. Can you explain that? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I can try. Yes. Hmm? Oh, that, that's for the screen. Yes, I forgot. Okay. Um, well, it's more maybe it's it's more about thinking choreo choreography in a more through a more social sociological from a more sociological point of view, and maybe um, I don't know. 
it's, I, I really find it hard. You know when you sometimes have worked through something academically and then it's not, it's not easy to say it in normal words? <laughs> so that's what I, what I struggle with. But, but um, uh, yeah, but I, I think it's very much that, that you look at choreography in a, through a more so sociological lens and um, yeah. What do you want to achieve by doing that? I think, I just think that uh, the theatre has a potential to, um, in a way, trans translate what's what's happening in society. Now, I, I'm explaining this in a bad way, but I don't manage to do it better right now. <laughs> but what, what you see physically in society into the theatre space, not through stories, but more through images, if you know what I mean. And those images can be the way you contribute space on stage, and you think spatial dramaturgy, or it can be something that influences the way you think choreography. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. 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 I was not the place so maybe you said something about it. Uh, the Fix and Foxy connection. Yeah. I was thinking about um, uh, how does it think about different uh, people in the audience, because um, the way you explained it, yeah. uh, a little bit um, that you think about a white Danish audience mm. uh, being taught maybe a view on themselves, but mm. for a lot of white audience mm. to auction right. uh, uh, slaves can be really traumatizing. So how does it deal with so? Yeah, that's a good question. I. The thing is, I actually, I, I met them when they were producing the play in Johannesburg. I didn't, I, di I haven't actually seen, the, I've just seen the work of it, but I haven't seen the, the, the finished uh, performance. I've just like read a lot of descriptions of it. But um, what I read from those descriptions, what that is, they, uh, that's actually one of the things that they succeed with, that they, uh, they don't look at them, they really take that into consideration that the, it's not only white Danish people, it's, it's uh, Danish people from different backgrounds. <laughs> so, yeah, so, I, but I don't know exactly how they navigated this situation. I just know that when, when, I, um, uh, when I was watching the, the performance uh, rehearsal, and then uh, they, in, they, I was kind of forced to suddenly participate because it's immersive, right? So I was pretty ready to just sit and observe and take notes and think. And suddenly I was on the floor, forced to do this kind of African, in a th very Theresa May. I don't know if you saw these pictures of her, when you really feel super white. <laughs> so, and that was kind of, there was something interesting there in the way that was uncomfortable. So, yeah, so I think that's kind of the tension that they worked with, but I'm sure that, yeah, he's, yeah. Mm. <laughs> Then also thinking about who is the audience and not always imagining in a European context the yeah. white audience. Exactly, I think that's very important as well. And I think a lot of these productions, the the, the risk with the with productions that try to turn the, turn things upside down is that they still see a world that is um, dichotomized. Whereas it's still it's still us them. Even if you turn it upside down, it's still them and us. And you know. And how can we go around that? I think it's very important. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Thank you. I want, was wondering how you, what you would say about the relation between the theater institutions or the scene uh, in general and the education, the theater education, because I yeah. think especially when you talk about devising methods, yes. then it's crucial that you have also a educational field which not only reproduces the hierarchies which are there in the institution. Yes, and, the, and that's, stuff. yeah, absolutely. And I think that's that's a conversation that is really necessary. Um, yeah, and this talk is also based on, <laughs> to be honest, it's based on my master's in, in international dramaturgy and I tried to kind of jam it. I've left out a lot of things and a lot of aspects, of course, but it was very much credit, criticizing the institutional theater. Because we know that uh, in the independent field, the hierarchies are often completely different. And uh, they are much more flat, and it's much starting from meeting to meet the per person, meeting another hu human, and then that's 
or maybe the start of production. So I think it's, I think my talk is maybe more than anything a critique of, of, uh, yeah, of the pitfalls of of the Western uh, theatre institution. But it's of course every everyone knows that systemic systems are really hard to change, even if you want to. Do you think in Norway there's a special chance because uh, like free groups? Uh, can find better funding than in other European countries? I think, I think, I think it's an important conversation for everyone. <laughs> and for me as well. I think I'm, I'm only like learning. I don't, I don't have any answers. This is just a reflections based on the past three and a half years of my life. But none of this I would say, do this and what you have done is wrong. You know what I mean? So that's important for me. Yeah. Um, you want the microphone? Oh no, I don't know. I, I think it's okay. I, because I think there are uh, many aspects here that are still very, very problematic. For example, uh, that most of the uh, theorists that you refer to are white men, and that the examples you mentioned also are very problematic, like the um, Fix and Foxy performance, for example, because that's what happens with that is that you use the black performers mm. as a tool for the white people to learn more about themselves. Mm -hmm. and that in itself is not unproblematic. No, it is. And the same with that two admitting uses, <laughs> oh, I'm white, male, I'm caught in the European uh, uh, narrative. Mm. How can I get out? Okay, I get a co -pro producer or yeah. co director who's black, kind yeah. of. Okay, then it's okay. So you know, like there's, it, there's so many layers as to these examples you mentioned mm. are also very problematic. It's also is. ways of seeing have a hierarchy in it, which yeah. has nothing to do with the with the the palaver that happened mm. after it, but is actually in the performance. Yeah. So I think and also by using only white male theorists. Mm. That's also a power thing. You Absolutely. Know? Because if you had chosen to use a black female, for example. Yeah, but I, in my in my masters, I, yeah. I, I in my masters, I, I did not <laughs> use only yeah. black. It was very I was very conscious from my side that I, uh, you know Sara Ahmed, of course, is essential, and also a lot of other theorists and a lot of other aspects. So I could have mentioned these in this talk as well. But it's important for me to stress that I see what you're saying, yeah. <laughs> and I think you're right. Um, I think you're right, and in a way, it's like it's it's, um, and that's why I'm emphasizing that this is not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about that performance because it was great and because it was right. It's more about also to stress how hard it is. Yeah, but then I think you need to problematize what is difficult with that performance, like what is yeah. the problematic aspects of it. Yeah, no, if no, but no, I, I, I could have yeah. said more about that in my talk. That uh, that is uh, that is a problematic aspect, but I think I do think we're from a Euros Eurocentric perspective, I think we're more or less trapped. And I think, in a way, whatever take we, it's it's really hard. It's it, I think it's really really hard to do something that no one can point to it and say, but what about this? What about this? What about this? I think it's it's almost impossible, but still we have to try. But I I I do, and then it's hmm. The, the, the American professor Thomas de France is a professor at Duke University in dance and African American studies. He said, "If you, to be really radical about these questions, mm -hmm. you give you give away power. You step aside. Exactly. You know, yeah. and that's that's the radical, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and that's not um, any of the performances. No, and no, no. <laughs> yes. But is it not?" Also giving away power when you also invite a co-director uh, and having what the, what is the option what is the alternative shouldn't we should we not collaborate? Uh, yeah, so and the, the, people, uh, um, yeah. because we are trapped in, in a way, yeah. so yeah. It's, it, it's problematic everything. But it's yeah. no, I, I just want to answer. I would just want to answer you because I I do think you're right. Um, and uh, the end of my master dissertation was pretty much what you say. So, um, and I could have emphasized that on, in more in my th talk, but I do think that it's, I think it's important to do both. I think actually when it comes to a, a question of power, I think that is because 
everything else than redistributing power is actually just fluff. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. It's just fluff, it just yeah. works. But it's more like, how do we do it and what, what steps are we taking in the process towards getting there? Because I think if it's, I really think it's important to do both. And I think both things also happen. But I think, I think it's one step in the right direction is to think differently about co-productions and all the aspects that are in place uh, in, in cross-cultural productions. Because I really think the level of reflection in many ways is quite low. And that's what I was saying, I'm just learning. Mm -hmm. And I know there's some more layers to take away. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah, um, thank you for the talk as well. And now it's a kind of interesting discussion. Very, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and we could go on and on. Yeah. Uh, but I think that there is some, the ethics here, mm -hmm. which I also believe that you're talking about, but, but that, that might be the next step. Exactly. To, because you're talking about redistributing and yeah. rethinking yeah. time and space and emancipation and so on. Yeah. And maybe it's also about time we start to rethink the ethics yeah. of dramaturgy and of working with theatre. Absolutely. And uh, initiating collaborative processes like devising and yeah. so on. Um, and I'd also like to say that when you bring in the Afrofuturism aspect as yeah. well, yeah. that's a way of emancipating. Also, so I do think that you also, you already have that aspect in your presentation yeah. um, of also listening and bringing less problematic uh, sort of perspectives into the presentation. Yeah, yeah, I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> but I appreciate your comment because I really think I really think it's you're pinpointing something and you're really like you know, and that, that's where we want to go because people are too nice to each other in these conversations and it's a problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not to saying that you're not nice, but it's like you're, on, <laughs> you're, you're honest, yeah. you're not like tiptoeing around yeah, it, yeah, if you know yeah, what I mean. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean. Yeah, was just uh, a comment to what Andrea talked about before with, uh, with, the, with like the other uh, independent field, more better to do this kind of project, but I think one issue that was raised in Cape Town at the Congress was a seminar about where do the money come from? Mm -hmm. You know how if, if Norway is, is the same, if it's uh, like that through the Arts Council of Real Institutions, and then you initiate a project and go somewhere, mm -hmm. you still have you are the one having the money. You are gonna yeah. have to uh, answer yourself for something in your country. So yeah. in some kind, of, in some way, you get kind of power through that as well. So Absolutely, also, I think that's. Also very, uh, the, the financial system is really not supporting I I new ways of, of um, creating pieces. Yeah, But I also think, hmm, a lot of people have said to me, when you work and talk with this, you can't really win. <laughs> you know, People are going to criticize you, whatever you say. Mm. And I think that is uh, right, because that's what I experienced. But it's also really important. And I think when we make work with this, you have to kind of dare to um, not be popular. <laughs> And dare to fail, really dare to fail, because, uh, yeah, because even if it's friction that's occurring, uh, you're at least trying, you're at least uh, exploring new narratives. Mm. Yeah. Can I just answer? Of course, I don't yes. mean that white and black people should not cooperate, but I think it has to do with perspective. You know, where is the story told from? Yeah, yeah. You know? not, not only cooperate, but operate. Because it's <laughs> exactly. that, uh, that he's the, only the co-director, not the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but then again, if you have... And that's, that's also a conversation that returns a lot, is that you create, uh, you create uh, parallel theatres, parallel organisation, parallel this and that, that are run by... You know? And that's not always the answers, answer either. Uh, and when I mean parallel, I mean like, um, and that's, I'm not saying that, uh, of course, one should support, uh, you know, uh, artists that are from minorities and really like their own productions and be ready for the message. <laughs> but I think that's also kind of a tricky part with funding that uh, you create uh, a parallel universe. But, but it was not in, uh, I didn't mean that. No, I know you didn't mean that. I just want to say. Cooperation. Yeah. I just yeah. would say. Yeah. Either you call to uh, Gearing also co-director, yeah. Yeah. or you call both directors. Yeah. So that's yeah, I, I I agree with that. I agree with that. But yeah. then you would probably not have the narrative that's in there. Exactly, yeah. and w w and no matter where, how much many times you turn it upside down, he is still the boss of that production. Yeah, in yeah. a way, yeah, mm -hmm. and that's a problematic part of it. Okay, it's hard. Shall we agree on that? No. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Oh yeah.
doing it in test, like mm -hmm. what you were doing on these yeah. things. Yeah. And also this can have some type of understanding of that kind of alienation mm -hmm. that exists. Yeah. And I think as well as this narrative that keeps people as this sort of like, oh, the non-white people are the refugees, or yeah. the non-white people are the people that don't speak the same language. Mm -hmm. The non-white people are the people that don't know how to make service. Yeah. Essentially, this whole conversation is continuing the mm -hmm. same thing. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I think like, idea of like collaboration and like thinking about or having to report back to your own government it's mm -hmm. like your own government look after the non-white people who are not Norwegian or they mm -hmm. look after the non-white people yeah. who are British and it's like mm -hmm. I think it's that thing of like looking at where these same ideas of otherness exist even within the way that we think about how we're going to approach these collaborations or how they yeah. don't exist. Absolutely. And also I think like supporting the people who are doing like really incredible And I think that's that's why it's really important to use the word Eurocentrism is uh, you know like it's it's a master narrative that is still existing as an overarching master narrative I would say in Western Europe but that doesn't mean that there's not a lot of other narratives that's not the only one that exists. Shall, shall we end? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Thank you so much. Back to the picture before. So.